What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Today is the Patron Picks episode, and the patrons have asked, what's going on with Meshtastic? What's going on there? What's the latest and greatest with the software, the hardware, and how one might get started, and maybe some novel use cases that you could deploy to be kind of interesting and fun to add to your radio hobby. This is license-free radio communication, so you could use this for emergency preparedness, for just keeping tabs on family and friends that are in and around the area off of the traditional cell phone grid. And yes, there is encryption. So enjoy the memes, and we'll get started real soon. going everybody i am josh ki6naz today we are going to be talking about mesh tastic i'm going to give you my 30,000 foot level information or my thoughts on it and then i've got a couple of smart people that are actually on the development team and designers of different aspects of mesh tastic that we're going to be talking to to answer your questions but as always we do an after chat on my discord the ham radio crash course if you have any questions mesh tastic related will probably point you towards their discord but if it's radio questions or anything like that make sure to join us over there because we'll be doing a, sh a show after this show called the after chat so mesh tastic uses LoRa technology, long range is the idea, uh, the mode of communication. It's For Americans, it's 915 megahertz, and you can send text messages with it. You can also do some sensor data, GPS information. There's some telemetry aspects to it. But the primary use case is a semi-protected, as rigid as you believe that encryption is, ability to send text messages back and forth between these devices. And I got a novel six miles or so ish uh, from the dense suburbs i've been able to push that out further as i changed up some antennas and used different devices which we will be talking about and i also will talk a little bit about my future projects but if you're interested there are a ton a ton of links in the description for this video including the main meshtastic page but also like you know where can you find cool devices in fact uh one of the that, that's a really good one we'll talk about the rack here in a little bit but uh, one of the one of the people on this uh, show, they make boutique mesh tastic devices that are available on their Etsy store. So they take all the guesswork and sometimes a little bit of the hardcore nerd stuff out of the equation. So if you go check out the link in the description, I think that would uh, maybe help you out. Let's bring the guests on and say hi. Hello, how's it going, guys? How's it going, Josh? So hey, we got we got Tony G on the bottom here, and we got Ben above him. And you are developers, designers for Mesh Tastic. You want to give a little bit of background on yourself, and we'll go from there. Sure, I'll go first. So um, I'm Ben, or the Ben Turn, as <laughs> as I'm known on Discord and and GitHub. Uh, but I've been working on the firmware for Mesh Tastic and some of the ancillary projects for a few years now and um, kind of lead up the efforts on that front and make sure that releases go smoothly and, and those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Excellent. And I just, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm watching people's videos a little bit better because we literally just met kind of in internet <laughs> person a couple of minutes ago. I just noticed all those printers in the background. Tony, you uh, you seem to be a prolific 3D printer kind of guy, but tell us about yourself. How you doing, man? Hey, good, good. Um, I've, I've, uh, I'm Tony G, as no, I'm known on printables. Um, I go by Trofo, T-R-O-P-H-O on the Discord. Um, I've been involved with the, the, the uh, project for about two years. I just started getting uh, interested in it after I found, uh, I think I found like the disaster radio at the time, you know, searching for off-grid comms just for hiking and backup comms. And uh, I stumbled into this. And I decided to make one modification to a case that I needed a little change to, and then I sort of exploded as I decided making, you know, making all kinds of little cases for all the various radios. I made some waterproof stuff, which uh, is all on my uh, my printables page that uh, that outlines uh, or has all the different you know devices and then cool standalone stuff like this that I know we'll probably talk about later. Um, I've uh, I was in the army for twenty years, so I definitely have a. Uh, 
the skill for communication and understand being self-reliant, independent, and being able to um, make the most of even the most uh, modest technology like Laura. So mm -hmm. I'm really enthusiastic about this. I'm glad to be involved in the project, and thanks for having me. Oh, well, I I should say it's a little fortuitous that I was able to get you guys. I uh, I have all my me my mesh devices, my lore devices, mesh tastic, all working. But a uh, one device, I had a problem with my my rack device, and I went on the Discord, and you guys, all of you, super fast to to help me out. And then we're like, well, shoot, why don't we just have you on? Because <laughs> that's probably going to be a lot better if you're available, and you all you happen to be available. So this is absolutely fantastic that you've taken the time. Thank you so much for that. I've got a question to kind of kick things off, but uh, first, we got a super chat. Wild coincidence, says Steve T. Just started printing a case for my T-Deck. Loaded uh, YouTube, and here you are talking about Laura. So, yep, we'll be talking about Laura the rest of the show. Thanks for, for coming out there. So, based off of my very 30,000-foot level, how would, we, how would we kind of bring that down and start bringing it into usable sense? What, what, what are the applicable use cases from both your point of views for this uh, this technology? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, one of the obvious use cases, and I think that the one of the ones that kind of brought me to the table and, and a lot of others is like disaster preparedness. You know, Tony mentioned uh, disaster radio, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that project kind of um, lost maintainership and we, we absorbed some of, some of that audience um, so, you know, just establishing communications that I think the fact that it's license free, um, by, by its nature also makes it just really accessible. Um, you know, people like to use their phones to text, right? So we give the ability to, to text, um, off grid. So, I mean, that, that brings just a, a whole host of use cases, but there's also a lot of, um, usability in terms of, uh, I think you mentioned it, telemetry. So like, off-grid weather station so if you've got um a weather station that's like way out uh from wi-fi right you, you need a way to connect that data and bring it in um you know search and rescue um because we have uh the ability to send positions and waypoints um those are kind of the the big ones um there's people always come up with just off the wall use cases. I'm always surprised. I think somebody in the Discord the other day mentioned that they were using it to track uh, scaled down model trains around a park. So, oh, uh, that's cool. <laughs> what do you think, Tony? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was looking for a solution for off grid comms in areas that didn't have cellular connectivity. That was the coverage was terrible. We go out to a place called Deep Creek, Maryland, way out in Western Maryland. It's that little triangle that's actually probably was, you know, seceded from West Virginia or we took it, whatever, in Maryland. Um, and there's a great park out there. But I initially had T-Mobile the first time we went out there. And it's it, that's at the time in 2010, it was already abysmal in a regular area. And out there it was, you know, it was like, you know, using smoke signals wouldn't have been an improvement because it would have been something. Um, so I started looking into off-grid comms. I found Mishtastic and it's... While the cell network's gotten a lot better out in Western Maryland, there's still some dead spots. And I think that's probably one of my primary use cases. But, um, you know, between uh, the Army and Boy Scouts, the whole be prepared, you know, you're thinking of, you're thinking of, uh, you know, possibilities of the future, like Ben mentioned with disasters, things that at the time, you know, when it hits, you're like, man, I wish I prepared for this or I wish there was something. Fantastic can be that, you know, as long as you prepare and plan. Um, and at the end of the day, just having fun with mm -hmm. tinkering with hobby boards and putting things together. I, I finally learned how to properly solder uh, thanks yeah. to this project after years of nice. burning myself in plastic, you know, left and right. Um, so it's cool. It's fun. And it's just, it's fun to play with, but it actually has a practical use. So uh, I, I actually have a practical demo because like I said, we kind of ad hoc put this together. So I'm going to demonstrate this really quickly and you guys just tell me where I'm screwing up. But so that's a T-beam. That's the, uh, the, the current, one of the current kind of, mm, I don't know, all in one might be the wrong term, but it's it's modeled after kind of like a BlackBerry when it's turned on. It always seems to do better when it's on, right? I turned this off to save battery because uh, we'll probably mention this, but this guy has a, a fairly limited battery. And uh, we're starting starting now, hopefully. Hopefully starting now. There it is. Oh, Josh, that, just for the, uh, for, the, for the audience, that's a T-deck. Oh, T-deck. Sorry. What did I say? T-beam. But that's what oh, T-beam. Yo, <laughs> right. This is a T-beam. I was looking there, at the T-beam. <laughs> Yeah. So we got a couple of LoRa devices yeah. right here, and they're actually all uh, kind of networked together. They're sharing a channel. So if I say, you know, hi, stream, 
Uh, I should spell it right. I used to have this BlackBerry. I think my keyboard's got a problem. Oh, there it is. Okay. So if I go ahead and type my message and I hit enter here. Which uh, which case is that for that uh, T deck? I the one that uh, I had the least amount of trouble printing. <laughs> I think I printed a couple <laughs> of versions of this, and this one had the least amount of trouble on my bamboo. But now you can see on the device the the T beam. It's saying high stream. If we can get it to focus, mm -hmm. but you can trust me, it's it's saying that, and it's also saying that on the little Helltech and the Helltech. Both these are available on Amazon, but you can buy them direct from Helltech and and Lilligo for the uh, the T beam. Lilligo also makes this T deck. Again, links are in the video description. But the uh, the kind of approach to this is these can be separated from each other. In fact, this little T beam with this antenna on it does really, really well, and it runs off of an 18650 battery. Uh, and you can also apply solar in some cases to some of these devices, and they'll just kind of run and run. In fact, we couldn't get to it today for the video, but this is the uh, the little rack device in here, along with the GPS antenna and the antenna for doing LoRa and a solar panel on top. And if you do this right with an appropriate size battery, you can basically keep it running just on that small little solar panel. So that's the concept, and you could spread these out and kind of going back to the fundamental nature of this, this is a meshed system. So if those devices are all channeled together, uh, they'll be able to communicate. And as some fall off or as some come onto the network, they'll mesh and either figure out the most efficient path to send your message through multiples of those devices. Is that about right? Is that about how you'd say it? Or what would you add to that? Yeah, yeah, you you totally got it. So, um, you know, with the mesh network, we have a limited number of uh, what we call hops, right? Which is a device rebroadcasting to to another device, and I think our default is three. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you're looking at you know three potential hops, but be between you and the next um, node that you're trying to communicate to on the mesh, uh, and we we allow folks to adjust that number a little bit, but I will say. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> um, so, that's 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 one well, of those things. Is, where is you, that a, is that just because of a, a memory space kind of thing, or what? What's the deal with that? It uh, it's uh, mostly airtime because um, the the amount of rebroadcasting that goes on as that hop count increases sure. Uh, sure. happens happens to kind of uh, monopolize quite a bit of airtime, and so mm -hmm. people people uh, as, as they do like to turn the knob to to one thousand. And uh, you know, f figure it's going to work better. More is r better, right? And then, of course, like, why are my messaging so slow? It's just know? like APRS <laughs> packets, right? We, if we if we make it too many rebroadcasts, we've we've fundamentally re-spammed and saturated the network uh, with a limited amount of frequency access. So uh, I said I said nineteen hundred and fifteen megahertz. That's the license free space. There's uh, there's multiple bands that are available for these devices and. I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong. There's also a 400 megahertz ish band that goes along with this too, right? Yeah. Um, so the certain certain ISM bands uh, globally use the 433 megahertz. That's kind of this the center band, and and obviously you could use that here uh, in the U.S. on on um, uh, 70 centimeter amateur mm -hmm. uh, operation if you set. Uh, the device up into what we call license mode, which basically turns off encryption, um, sets the um, the node up to broadcast your your call sign every ten ah, minutes. So okay. just we try to do our due yeah. diligence to mm -hmm. to make sure everything's on the up and up for ham mode, so that people feel comfortable about it. So you but can, you can ham also, it, but you lose the encryption, right? Correct, and you can do that. Um, I, I'll just say you can do that also on thirty three centimeter band um in the u.s as well but additional power is kind of the 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 idea there but uh, if you you know if you want that additional power then you, that there is a path for that with the with the amateur okay you, i i realized also that i didn't i didn't show one thing on my little demonstration there uh while the t deck has the keyboard and all that these devices they require some kind of tablet or phone so that's actually one of the devices that's connected to my phone so the message did go through it went through all of them but it it afforded it to your phone via bluetooth or they'll also work on wi-fi and there's actually a couple of 
fun ways to set one of these up that would potentially connect through your your home Wi-Fi that you could access as though it was a remote messaging type capability that doesn't necessarily require like a phone or anything like that, right? Is that how some of you guys deploy your systems or what do you do in your case as far as your home setup and maybe your on-the-go setup? I have a, a solar uh, actually node on my roof that uh, I actually, I have it in my attic and I have a cable run out and it connects to my roof. So I can have long distance, kind of a home base situation. I don't have to worry about battery power though. I do have a battery backup in there. Um, I have a vehicle node in my truck. So I have a, like a little, uh, you know, 18 inch. I actually think it's three feet. Yeah. It's a three feet long outdoor, like fiber lace antenna with a magnetic base on the top of my truck. I can deploy it when I want to, I can take it inside. Um, I have, you know, my little waterproof devices. I have my keyboard devices. I have a whole bunch of stuff. It's, it's handy that I can design them so I can make all the little, you know, niche use cases. But the bottom line is having a handheld mobile node that either you connect to your phone with and use the app or you have a keyboard, one of wherever your base station is going to be, whether it's your house, a vehicle, anything like that, or you just set up something, you know, you throw a radio up in, in a tree and pull it with a rope and get it as high as you can to cover an area temporarily, pull it down when you're done. Sure. You know, you have a lot of options or deploying a solar repeater in key areas in your region to really expand your mesh. Cause the more you have, you know, the more that they can serve as relays for each other. Um, and also we always want to get permission before we go and deploy random things out in the wilderness <laughs> or in urban areas, because reactions can be mixed and we don't, we don't want to get ourselves in trouble. So I'll say that for the audience, uh, ask, you know, act, what is it? Um, uh, act and then ask questions later, right? Or, you know, mount, mount your node first, ask questions later. I don't right. recommend doing that. It's better you, you cooperate. And there are a lot of great ham uh, enthusiast groups in your area that might have towers, might be amenable to expanding in their radio family. It could really be open to something like that. So uh, my, that's my daily carry is basically a handheld node, uh, one on my truck, and then, of course, base station at home with a solar panel to charge it. Now, the base station at home, is that higher up? What, what, what are you using for an antenna? What kind of mass do you use? I'm assuming you want to get it as high up as you, as you can, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have it up. Uh, I have a two-story house, so it's mounted up on the, the peak of the south-facing uh, uh, part of my roof. And it's a like standard, you know, three-foot fiberglass antenna with like a little pole mount. So there's, you know, like you'd mount any antenna or something like that. Just get away from the house. Um, uh, don't really have a lot of lightning here. So like a lightning arrest or a lightning rod is necessary though. I know people probably cringe when I say that cause you should always have one, but I haven't done that yet. Um, so yeah, getting it two stories up, it makes a huge difference. Um, and more Watts and a higher gain antenna, they're not always the best solution. It really just depends on your region and how far you want to go and how many devices, you know, fix mobile, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's definitely different from what like high power radio enthusiasts might enjoy deploy it differently. You're not going to be transmitting with single radio, you know, 500 miles bouncing off the ionosphere. Um, it's something you have to kind of think out, but it is super easy. And, and again, the bottom line is the more of these you have, the bigger your network can be. That's the cool part. And they're cheap. How about yeah, you, Ben? And what do you got? I, I was just going to say that um, kind of piggybacking off the, you don't need the high gain antenna, you know, our, all of our distance records, I think were with little Omni whip antennas, right? So, I mean, we've got I think it was 250 something kilometers from uh from I think it was Montana to uh a node in in Canada. So I mean they're huge distances and that's you know no no fancy that's all on the defaults with with just decent radios and omnis on on both sides. Um and so one I like to kind of deploy a similar setup to what what Tony's talking about where you've got your handheld um, device paired to your app with Bluetooth, and then you can set up your your sort of base station node or your advantageous position node, um, even outside, like onto your property if it's if it's solar powered, and just get it in the highest possible location, and let it relay all that traffic. You know, you don't have to be connected to your your station. I think that's the that's the kind of the secret sauce to Meshtastic is is understanding that. Don't let me forget, because I, I want to talk about different modes within Meshtastic, like when you deploy a repeater mode, et cetera, et cetera. But, it's, but do you even do that? Do you just leave it in base settings and just kind of, again, let it mesh itself? It's supposed to mesh anyway, right? That's kind of what its job is. Yeah, I always recommend that people play with it on the defaults first, mm. because it's, it, you know, it. 
frequently when people will run into problems, it's because they've done all the little flip flipping the switches and they're like, oh, now suddenly they can't communicate. Well, if you go back to the defaults, it probably will, <laughs> will yeah. work. And then you you kind of get more confident with with ratcheting some of the settings down to to what you like with you know changing broadcast intervals and stuff. That's that's what most people end up changing, I would say, and setting up their own private channels. Right. Um, you know, most the, the apps let you generate that in, in the in the form of a QR code, so you can conveniently kind of scan it, and somebody else can come into your mesh um, pretty easily that way. So I'll let you guys uh, direct this a little bit. Do you want to talk about some of the updates that we've seen within the MeshTastic software, or do you want to maybe kind of hit what you might recommend a newbie looking at doing this for the first time? Maybe not a ton of experience in this. Whole, maybe this is their first kind of non-phone radio that they might be playing with. What would you? Uh, what direction would you like to go? I want to hit both of them, but where do you want to start? What do you think would be better for people? I. I don't really have a strong preference, but it sounded like your audience was kind of wanting to know some of the updates to yeah. what's happened with MeshTastic in, in the past couple of years. So I can kind of give some of the cliff notes. Okay. A lot has changed. That'd be great. <laughs> um, you know, we obviously we move pretty, pretty quickly in, in the MeshTastic ecosystem. There's been a lot of app development, a lot of firmware development. Um, one of the biggest things I would say is we've, We've done a big focus on um, extensibility and making it easier to do things like plug-in sensors. Like we have uh, a lot of uh, Adafruit sensors that are plug-and-play now that you can just, um, particularly with the Rack Wisp Block system, uh, because that is a that is a true plug-and-play system with most of their their sensors. There's no soldering required. You just buy buy the sensor and plop it onto the baseboard and screw it in. Um, so we focused a lot on things like telemetry, um, enhancements to positioning. Um, we've got a lot more work put into the standalone device experience that I don't think was even really present two years ago. And Tony can probably speak to that a little bit better than, than I can because he's that's, that's kind of his wheelhouse. But those are kind of the core areas, I would say, and just a lot of under the hood improvements with the with the hardware and the radios. I noticed that with the the apps that they are just they're just more polished. It's, they're mm -hmm. easier to use. It's the same effective capabilities, but the look and feel between the Apple and the Android is a little bit closer now. And you know, it, they're just they're a little bit makes more sense on how to get channels going, which we should probably talk about that too towards the end. Uh, basically, they all default to the same channel, right? So if you were just bought one of these things and loaded a new firmware on it, started it up, they'd all be able to talk, even if you some random person was running a default load, they'd all just mesh together and it would be one big party line. But you can create different channels, including including up to 256 uh, AES encryption, right? 256 bit, is that correct? Yeah, you can create up to eight channels, um, and each of them can have a a uh, up to a 256 bit AES key. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, you can also choose like a 128 bit key um, if for some reason you want less security <laughs> yeah why would you go less right yeah in security's <laughs> case you never that's when you want to roll the, the die all the way up tony why don't you add to that with uh i know you're you kind of got some of these all-in-one units or these you know individually capable ones i think they're really cool yeah thanks um so the keyboard support isn't necessarily a very recent development but i think integrating it into devices is uh it kind of just started as actually the, the, the module that, uh, that it depends on to use this, this card KV keyboard and, and the one that's actually in the T deck as well, uh, relies on a module still called, um, the canned messages module, which initially it was set up to just send preset messages. If you push a button, um, you know, we had a, this is a rotary encoder actually that Garth, uh, the iOS and Apple developer, he sells a device that has a screen, a rotary, it's a rotary coder is just a knob that you can also push in as a button, right? So it looks like a dial. You can rotate through um, preset messages, push that button, push the dial and uh, the knob, and it'll send the message. And that was the initial intent of the rotary encoder module, or sorry, the canned messages module. And it was expanded to add support for the card KB, which is something that M5 um, produces. And that's what's actually in the heart of this. It's a 
it's a keyboard. Actually, I have this case that's not put together necessarily. I can get it open. And underneath um, the plastic and the rubber, there's actually this little uh, keyboard module, right? Oh. If, if anybody has seen one of these. Yeah. yeah. It, it's been used for other projects as well. It's got these little hard buttons. And, you know, what I did is just make it a little easier to use by by putting it in a case, obviously, and then adding some nice soft TPU rubber buttons um, and keys. But uh, the biggest thing is actually just extending the utility of that. And something that I'll tease a little bit, no promises on timeline, um, but there is a significant user interface overhaul on the horizon, not just for device screens, for the little devices, right? Like T-beams and, and, and the rack screens and uh, these little OLEDs, but more standalone devices that have more... Uh, they have dependence on these tiny screens and don't have a phone associated and it's paired with them. Um, and I think that's probably going to be a game changer. Um, all the features recently have been amazing. Not only is stability improved, um, but extensibility as, uh, as Ben mentioned, but uh, standalone devices are definitely something that is a big priority for, you know, version 3.0 of uh, the mesh tastic firmware. And it's, it's not a design by committee, but we're taking a lot of um, input from users and developers, not just our own good ideas that we force on everybody, um, but a more, you know, cohesive, collaborative and community approach to the standalone device UI so we can have uh, lots of options because I love options. That's why I'm an Android user. I know. Sorry, Apple. <laughs> I know the iOS guys, but I like options. I like choice. I like being able to build my own or just buy something that fits. And I think um, just all the options we have, all the choice, it's amazing. The developers have done an amazing uh, work, you know, amount of work on this. Uh, it started as this tiny little niche use case thing, and now it's exploded into um, use cases like the, there's a you know, volcanic eruption in Iceland. And we have a community user here who was, was soliciting ideas like, we have all these pets that are going to be running around. We need to evacuate them. How do we set humane uh. safe traps and monitor them using a mesh network to know whether that trap is filled so we can go out there and take, you know, retrieve the animal before anything bad happens to them and get them out? And it exploded into this conversation of all these great ideas. Um, so there's a ton of community involvement, a ton of great ideas out there. And uh, we keep listening to them and, and, and put the best ones together and make the best of this project. I think it's going to go really, really far. I love that. So is it just some, now my mind's a spinning. Is that some kind of like relay where the door closes or whatever? It trips the, the sensor and it sends a message or something yes. like that? Oh, that's it's cool. exactly right. And I, you know, I suggest, Hey, what about solar power? And it's like, well, I mean, if there's not enough volcanic ash, you know, in the clouds to right. the battery, yeah. it's probably good. But if they can go out each day, change the battery, check the trap just to make sure there's you know, nothing in it. Uh, or there is, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was exactly right. Simple is always the best solution. Oh, and that's and that's, yeah. that's what we were talking about before before the the stream started with the detection sensor module where you're you're kind of just monitoring a pin for like high low state that's kind of the like use case for it right is like the mailbox opened or i have a motion sensor device that just triggers a pin high just to fire off a message and know that that happened mm -hmm. um and it's just it's such a simple uh, easy, easy thing for a user to, to add to, um, their mesh. Yeah, that's, that is, uh, I mean, I mean, we were, we were, I was geeking out a little beforehand. We were having a little bit of fun talking about all this stuff, but since it's built on Laura, which is like the internet of things technology, that's literally passing sensor data. So the fact that you can add sensors and Adafruit's all about this, it's like, oh man, there's like the sky's the limit almost. And you can leverage all that Laura fun stuff along with, Meshtastic and being able to send messages and still having that user capability, that user information that, you know, would be really cool in these little ad hoc situations. And it's, it's, it's really, it, it so that, that's probably where we should dip into the getting started part. But um, it, it, there's all kinds of novel ways to add sensors and just kind of build your own little kit using the rack setup, the whiz block system and all that stuff. So if you were to tell somebody, hey, or they're interested, right? They reach out to you. By the way, do reach out to them. They're on their own Discord. They have their own Meshtastic Discord. They're extremely helpful. The link is in the description to join them. Uh, they have a server link there that you can follow into that. So if you're already on mine, you might as well join theirs too, because you can ask their questions and pass it on. But where would you where would you point people to get started in this? And to have, let's, let's say, you know, we're hams. You know, a lot of people here watching are hams, right? So we're going to want like... We want a lot of range. We want a lot of capability. So what would you point people? 
Um, I, um, I would say uh, a lot of, I mean, everyone knows what a T-beam is, right? And they keep buying them and they're, they're great all-in-one devices. They work, they work reasonably well. They're cheap. You can put a, an 18650 battery in there. Um, you know, and the battery life, it, it leaves a bit to be desired, right? Uh, the rack wireless RAK, uh, definitely more of a, a, a battery, you know, um, friendly solution and it snaps together, you know, either snaps together and has tiny screws that keeps it together. Um, you can 3d print your own cases. You can do all these things. Um, they're, I think the better hardware solution, in my opinion, I, I base all of my devices that I sell or the cases on your primarily rack stuff, um, just because of that power consumption, because of my use case, right. If I'm out in the wilderness, I want to have a battery that lasts more than, you know, 20 hours. Right. But if you can get a good deal on like a, a, a Heltec, H-E-L-T-E-C, that's a Heltec version three mm-hmm. for 17, 20 bucks, or buy a pair of them for 35, buy it. Any of these devices are great to start with, to dip your toe in the water and get into this project. Um, and then you'll find over time, oh, you want to build a solar node? Well, the more power, uh, you know, sipping devices are probably the better solution for that. But if you know you're going to charge your device every day, you can get away with a, a one-day battery life and, and, and save some money and maybe build more nodes you give to your your friends and family for whatever reason. Um, so I think, I think any of them are, I know, you know not to point in any particular device is, uh, uh, as the best one. So it really depends on the use case. So I'd say whatever one you can afford and you can buy two or three to really prove the mesh, uh, you know, capability out. I think they're, they're all great. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of similar, uh, in, in my, my viewpoint that as, as Tony, like the, the rack stuff, um, particularly because the NRF 52 baseboards are just so power efficient, like they make the best mobile nodes in, in my mind, because that, that battery life is, is so nice to be able to take something that doesn't have to be charged for days. Um, but like you said, the, the, the Helltech board, some of those, um, cheaper budget options or actually have pretty good radius built into them. And if you're just using something on your desk or you want to set up something that you're going to have always powered all the time via USB, then maybe power um, excessive power consumption isn't really a concern. So um, it really de- just depends. And, you know, the other thing that, that I, I think a lot of people don't really think about when they first get devices like I'm gonna need a case for this thing. And if you don't have a 3D printer, if you're not a tinker, uh, you gotta go to to somebody like Tony that that has cases available. So that that's a consideration too, right? If you're gonna run around town with this this thing, then <laughs> you probably want to get a case for it. You probably don't want to carry a a mesh tastic starter kit in your pocket with a lipo. <laughs> <laughs> or a, or a no. big old battery bank for USB. I mean that works, yeah. no question. It, but it does. A lot of these slick things. I mean, by the way, this is Tony. Uh, he's on Printables. I have linked him in the video description as well. There, he's designed some really really cool devices. And I think he said if it if it does mesh tastic, he's made a case for it at this point. Uh, so <laughs> literally, you can go crazy with multicolored type stuff. Um, and with this, I'm assuming, Tony, feel free to jump in there. You also have the capability to add batteries to this. That one in particular looks like it could take a big old battery. But that's a that's a major part of this, too, is that you're building the kit to do the thing that you want it to do, right? Like you, you add a, a larger battery, smaller battery, larger solar panel, smaller solar panel. And ha, ha, speak to that a little bit as far as your design aesthetic and kind of where the, you go with it. Oh, sure, sure. Well, my first case I designed, you know, for the TB beam you know, that's an easy one right there. And I started jumping into the RAK wireless, you know, rack wireless and some other ones that have the, they use the, uh, you know, smaller lithium polymer, you know, flat pack batteries. Yeah, flat pack and guys, yeah. I, I designed for what I had and I realized, well, if I'm designing for some of these, you know, ripped out of another device or, or hard to find batteries, I need to change my strategy. So I started looking for commonly found batteries on Amazon dimensions that you could use um, you know, to, to, and then I got requests, Hey, how about this battery? How about this battery? This sticker one's great. And I offer, you know, three, four, five, you know, uh, v- variations of battery backs, right. To accommodate various batteries. You saw my monster one for the rack wireless boards that it takes two, uh, 18650 batteries for up to 7,000 milliamp hours. And I, I'd say if you want a month's runtime without GPS, that's <laughs> the one for you. But if you don't mind charging every couple of days, you could probably get something with, that's a lot thinner than that. Um, so, um, and if you're really bold, e- even in the team beam, the T beam, you know, takes the 18, 650, uh, 650 cylinder battery, yeah. um, you could desolder that battery holder 
put a flat battery in there. I make it back for that too. So like I said, I love choice and I, I want to give people as many choices as it, as it, they can apply to their use cases. Uh, I think I've done that. And every now and then I'll still get someone to say, Hey, can you squeeze this component in there? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll try it. Or they'll send me a design and, uh, you know, I'll work it into mine and give them credit. Right. And, uh, that's, that's what it's all about is, uh, options and creativity. Yeah. We're getting a number of fantastic questions and don't worry, we're, we're going to try and work through them all. Um, but but guys, we'll we'll get to that here in a bit in a minute. I, I want to show the T beam really fast again to to exactly ex- to illustrate the point. But I took mine out of my case. It's it's got the eighteen six fifty on the back and the battery holder. But as you can see, the the actual body of this thing is it's mostly battery. And so if you put a flat pack in there, you could get a cool little tiny unit that you could kind of carry on you, carry around wherever. And uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty novel with with a lot of these things. Now um, you mentioned so I, I think a lot of people. By the way, Andy Kirby. Yeah, somebody already mentioned Andy Kirby. Andy Kirby on YouTube's been doing a lot of fun stuff. Um, I kind of when I made my videos, I mainly focused on the T beams, but these Helltechs, they're kind of new. They weren't out when uh when I made my first video. Talk to those a bit because I think you guys both said you prefer the racks over the Helltech. Is there a reason for that, or you know what? Where is that all coming from? I think most of it is the the power efficiency of the rack, right? Mm-hmm. Like the uh, the Helltech V3. So w- when you did your original video, it, the Helltech V2s might have been out. Uh, and they yeah, were kind I think so. of They were kind of a somewhat shady choice. Yeah, um, no, the T beam was the preferred choice, no question. When I was when I was playing around with these like a year or two ago. Right. They 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 were a quirky device, but the the Helltech V3 came out. I don't I. I can't remember exactly when, but it's been it's been out for probably the better part of a year now, and so they added the USB C connector, which is like okay, that's yeah. that's nice. Uh, but they also added um, an SX twelve sixty two radio, and so that's the same radio that's in the um, the rack wireless and oh. the the premium T beams. It has more link budget than the uh, a, a lot of the other radios on the on the market. So if you find something with the SX twelve sixty two, that's the preferred uh, radio because it has uh, twenty two dBm versus twenty dBm output. But it, more importantly, I would say has uh, they they call it an RX boosted gain mode that we enable by default, and it oh. gives it just more of a, a higher gain uh, front end. So you you get more. A little bit more link budget with that. It's I've definitely noticed a difference with uh, reliable packet delivery when you turn that on. Yeah, I, I've I've yeah. now. Oh, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. There it is. No, oh, I was just showing ahead. the Helltech V3. It looks a lot like the V2. It's got USB-C, so I mean, it, it it's the same form factor. Uh, and you know, uh, you can you can throw in a case like this. I have my six, you know, 18650 battery in here, right? So oh, nice. Oh, that'll run for a long add time. Add a GPS module. And my, I haven't called it this publicly, but in my mind, this is the, the better than a T-beam radio because it's half the price, better radio. Mm. Uh, they, now, Lilygo came out with a T-beam Supreme, which is a nice board too. It has all the bells and whistles that this one does, but it's a lot more expensive. But it's also one of those all-in-ones, right? This, you have to, if you like to solder and tinker, you can put your own little... Frankenstein version together of this and get all the same stuff for cheap, but yeah. uh, you know it's the same radio, same processor. Um, and that's that's the cool thing about you know these options. So the, uh, to, then, a, to a ham. Oh, oh, go ahead, hold it up. Th- this is the mini, mi- the the one with a little lipo pack. So oh, your you your get, blurry you screen is a... it's seeing it. Oh it's no, blurring it out. It's green. <laughs> it's like you're holding up a it's, censored. It's like censored. you're holding up something that's censored from the internet. <laughs> uh, Big Laura doesn't want you to know about the hell tech. Put it in front of your face. I think it won't block it out. What? Yeah. What? What uh, GPS <laughs> sensor was that? That that you put in your case? What was the GPS sensor you're using there? Uh, that's a G- GT Golf Tango dash U seven GT dash U seven. Uh, it's based on the it is a Neo U blocks Neo six M. It's the same GPS. It's in the the classic T beam. You can get a pair of them on Amazon for like eighteen dollars, and uh, you know solder three or four wires, and you get yourself GPS are, on the Helltech. How Hell are you, you just, interfacing you know. that with the uh, Helltech? How does that interface? So is it this guy? Um, am I am I am I on the right one? It's this. It's this guy? Yeah. If if you go to the printables, my printables uh, page, you see the Helltech. Well, I have a little diagram that shows you the That's wiring it. for it. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's off of the Helltech mini case or the larger one, the uh, V3 case with the mesh 
Either one because if they both will take the GPS module. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then you and talk one about of the, the last pictures. It has a, a wiring diagram that shows you which one, which pins you wire it to. And oh, then there it is. The app, Look at that. Those pins in the mobile oh, app, I'm doing this. Go. I'm doing this. Cause yeah. I, I also have, I built my, the, I built my first Helltech, but it's, I just use off USB-C and I wanted to make this one, the, the 3d printed jobber. And yeah, the, these, I mean, they're, I cannot explain like here, I'm going to use my tiny hand as a reference size here, but the, the board <laughs> with the screen is is smaller. In fact, I'll, I'll put it in the tiny hand. You know, everybody mm -hmm. loves the, the tiny hand on the internet, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's such a tiny little little thing. And yeah, you can add whatever you want to it for GPS and that is valuable. So, I mean, may, maybe if you want, if anybody has a, a story or an anecdote in addition to like the, you know, the mentioning the, the traps that they're using in the volcanic areas, but like that GPS capability, I'm thinking of, having something like this for my kids something that I, I actually have something you might like oh um, okay i had a this is another cool use case and uh we we pitched this and and ben can talk about the development side of it briefly um i had a co-worker he was talking about his his neighbor's dog got loose and uh i told him briefly about my three print stuff and the project uh and he said man it'd be cool if like 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 an apple air tag if you could have this used for uh you know tracking a dog that runs away and i said well you know you'd have to have something on the collar you know and he's yeah. like you do that i said actually yeah my little my little rack 19003 yeah. micro case i offer one, a model you can download and print it has little slots to put on a dog collar right but that's only half of it i right. made the little nifty thing but it's worthless without you know firmware support i pitched the idea to ben and thus was born the lost and found device role so you can either configure a device remotely or if if you're using one on on a human being, you can manually do it yourself in the right. app. But the bottom line is it starts beaconing. You know, I'm lost, I'm lost, and sends a GPS oh. location out so you can see it on the map. And, you know, you can set the, I think the default's what, like five, five minutes spend, something like that. But um, it'll start tossing out to the mesh. All the devices on the mesh, I'm lost, I'm lost. So it's a dog, whether it's a person saying, I don't know where I am, can someone come me? It's not an SOS function. So only people that have, you know, devices on your mesh with your key set. You have to be, you but have to be meshed the cool to the device to say it's lost. Dog, uh -huh. uh, well, you can, well, there's something called remote administration. We can set up to send commands to devices oh. and configure them to do what we want. So we can okay. change the role remotely. If it's on your dog, your dog doesn't have a cell phone in sand, obviously. So <laughs> right. uh, this allows you to do that. And it broadcasts. And I told my buddy at work, Hey, your idea, we made it happen. And he's like, great. I don't know what it is, but you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. I like that. Uh, were you going to add something, Ben? I, I no, I was just going to say uh, the 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 uh, what he mentioned about it actually saying you lost uh, that that your device was lost. That's actually happening over the text channel too. So there's a distinction with like Meshtastic reports positions if you have um, a GPS enabled on the device. Now you could turn that off optionally, but okay. uh, those just show up over like the maps and the apps, but the, the lost and found module actually sends out text in addition to that. So it's, so it's actually letting you know that that person, you know, here's where they are. <laughs> that's super cool. I love that. Well, so that's exactly what I'm talking about is it, it's a anyone can do this, right? So you can hand this to a kid, you can hand this to whomever. In fact, that was my that was my big uh, goal for the the T deck here was that uh, my son is in, well within range of his elementary school based off of a home node that he'd be able to message me. The downside with the T deck is no GPS, at least uh, the way it comes. Has anybody slapped a GPS on this? And then like you know, even then, now the battery's going to be even worse, right? Because the battery life's pretty bad with that unit. Yeah, uh, I, I think so many in the community has. We have the pins, you know, that you can set that up. It's easy to define it in the mobile app. But like you said, it's going to destroy your battery of life. And yeah. I know with the, you don't want your kid to have a smartphone, so you right. might not be able to have the app to use. Like the, my little tiny case is great, but you have to have a phone to use it, right? Um, right. That's why I like so your little keyboard that, that messenger because that's going to be much better on battery life and it has mm, GPS, yes. right? And yeah, I mean, I have small hands too, so it's lo it looks big, but it is it is actually a very small device like next to um oh geez that oh here we go this is what's inside it so to get a, a sense of scale for mm. the rack you know 19007 that's actually what's behind the screen here it's it's not a large device so it's definitely something you can have in a well you need a cargo pocket to pocket it but it is possible yeah all right 
Um, I'm going to tell the chat, go ahead and, and um, I will, I can go back up, but if you want to type question and literally the word question in your question or at Ham Radio Crash Course, I'm going to start pulling questions here for hitting the guys. You don't mind if we go over the hour a little bit, right? Because I think I, I kind of sure. do want to show a little I'm bit on it. the actual application because, you know, that's kind of the big thing, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's do that really fast. And you guys, let me see, I'll, I'll add you to the shot here so you can, you can tell me when I'm, when I'm screwing up. Uh, or I'm I'm inevitably doing something wrong, right? Which is, <laughs> which I do constantly on my live streams. That's half of the fun for people, I think. Well, nothing but, ever works on camera. So no, I, not, it, never it, when you're when you're live either, right? We but, might not be any help. <laughs> yeah. So I I, I have a, I have an ant. So by the way, back when I I first got started with this, I would say that kind of Android was the. Uh, it, it seemed to have a little bit more of the feature set or at least some of the capabilities you wanted to do. So having an Android mm -hmm. tablet was kind of how I used it oftentimes. Um, but the iPhone app has gotten a lot better to the point that like, I don't, I don't see that much of a difference with it. So uh, sorry for the shiny screen. I wasn't able to get this on HDMI, but basically I made a, a channel, just, just one channel called uh, HRCC Crypto. And now all the devices show up here, just like you'd have a, a text message kind of, system for your friends buddies whatever so if i t decked you know a message it would it would show up or whichever device was sending it in fact i i think the t decks connected to the uh the android here but from an app standpoint this is it this is the primary like user controls of this and it gives you the the test here and how you use this it's it's a really novel approach so if you had multiple devices and guys you tell me how to do a better way of doing this but what you do is you you just take your phone uh, and you you just get the there it is. And if I click the mesh tastic button on my phone, uh, it'll add that channel to the app on the device for whichever you're synced to. So if my my app is connected to my T beam here, my Apple iPhone and the T beam, it will add that channel to this device, and and that's how you add the channel. So you kind of set up one device the way you want it. And then you just share that with another device to be able to, to get the channels over. Is that kind of the the easiest fundamental way of, of adding channels or sharing channels? Yeah, it, it totally is. I mean, there's there's other ways of doing it through like mm -hmm. the command line on on the computer, but you know, it's that's not grandma approved. Uh, well, yeah, share that, channels. <laughs> that's a fantastic point because I don't I don't have that uh, I don't have that set up here. But there is a like a, an application you can run gives you full control. You can do everything whether it's connected to a computer. Can you do it over Wi-Fi? Does it have the same UI over Wi-Fi? Or the, 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 you know, local network. Well, the the Android app and some of the command line tools can connect over over TCP IP um, for Wi-Fi or uh, the the rack also has an Ethernet module. So I want to I don't want to throw it out either because it can technically do the TCP. Yeah, thing. yeah. I guess uh, if you attach enough connectors to anything, mm -hmm. it could do all the things, right? <laughs> Yeah, right. And the the Android app can also do a serial connection to the device. Um and so can the command line ones as well. Uh that that has not hit the iPhone yet. Okay. It sounds like there's a big uh, interface update coming soon that was hinted on the show. So that's great. As far as um settings go, so this is where, you know, if you if you wanted to change devices. So I have a couple of known devices to this uh this tablet, I would click on them to be able to switch between them after you set them up initially. And there is a bit of handshaking you have to do. A lot of these are like low energy Bluetooth. So once you sync them up, it's going to ask you to set the region. Once you set them to US, though, they're pretty much good to go. As far as uh, if you go to radio configuration, so if you click the, the meatball menu, I'll go back, the little meatball menu there. It gives you a, enough, uh, all kinds of different controls here. But the, the thing of interest is probably this radio configuration menu there is a lot of stuff in here more than just uh we have the time left on the show to be able to answer all of that but all of the details for the advanced features are in there is there anything in here that i should probably show people that are potentially interested in something new or interesting or uh if they're starting out since i'm since i have it here i would say i, the I have roles. a suggestion oh go ahead ben I was just going to say the roles you we kind of hit on earlier with like uh -huh. the lost and found and and talking about the difference between like a repeater and and a traditional one. So if you go to device right there, um, we one of the things that we tried to do is provide a way to basically unlock a, a whole host of behaviors 
um, by setting one one specific role. So we've added a bunch of these and we'll probably continue to add them uh, for specific use cases. Client is the default one. And so that's like, I'm a, I'm a client of the mesh. So I'm just, I'm just an average show um, mesh tastic device that that gets paired to a phone and sends messages. But then you've got oddballs like client mute there that doesn't, doesn't broadcast. It observes only uh, router, which is intended to be kind of your advantageously placed node, but it also has some power saving uh, defaults oh, nice. built in there and router okay. client, which is kind of the the corollary to that, but keeps Bluetooth on. <laughs> it's like, I, I've got a well-placed node, but I want to connect to it with Bluetooth. Um, repeater is kind of similar in the fact that it, you know, it's assumed to be uh, an advantageously placed node. But the, the interesting thing about repeater is it doesn't actually show up on the mesh. So it's not actually broadcasting any kind of beacons or anything. It's only rebroadcasting. So it's it's more like a traditional ham radio repeater ah, um, okay. in, in that sense. And then we've got some other roles there like tra uh, tracker and sensor that like kind of prioritize like telemetry data or position data in the case of tracker. And um, I did see TAC client hidden and there's kind of a ATAC got mentioned multiple times, yes. which we're going to get to. So is that turning it into a TAC enabled device kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so that actually, it, one of the main things that that does is actually ratchet up all of the kind of traditional intervals for sending um, beacons and positions and all the things that MeshTastic wants to send as a mesh. Uh, normally, it turns a lot of those things up to kind of the max um, interval so that they don't get sent a lot because ATAC has its own uh, protocol for for all those sorts of things. So it kind of gets it gets the mesh tastic native stuff out of the way and says let let ATAC be kind of the the showrunner. Okay. Uh, for for that for that particular role. I like this client hidden. That's kind of. There's a little uh, secret. Yeah, that's agent. a secret squirrel. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a secret squirrel one. So that turns off a lot of the, like, uh, kind of similar in the attack. It turns off um, any, pretty much any uh, regular broadcast, and it only rebroadcasts messages from your mesh, your private mesh. Oh. So it's more of, it's more of kind of like a, a hidden node, but it's still a node on the mesh technically. This is how you like you annoy yeah. your neighbor. Like they can't reach you, but you can always send a message to them, even though you're on the same network. You got a secret backdoor node, kind of in their backyard, hidden. Is that the idea? I'm <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's something else, but <laughs> well, it's kind of it's kind of intended to be somewhat of a clandestine operation thing. I don't I don't Ooh. know entirely how people are using it, but it was requested a lot. So wow, yeah. The default is if you set up, you know, your default channel. Uh, Every device you have could potentially broadcast or would by default rebroadcast or relay any other mm -hmm. uh, mesh tastic node stuff. Someone's driving by, just walking by your mesh and range, your mesh is going to help. It's that community communication mm -hmm. sort of idea. But if you don't want that for whatever reason to save mesh utilization, battery life, whatever, you can you can do that like Ben described, just your stuff. And that's uh will that work even if your channels are not decoding those those messages? It'll just pass them through kind of thing? Correct, because it uh, so it's they have to have the same LoRa parameter. So there's okay. there's stuff like frequency offsets and things that right. have to match. But but in terms of your actual mesh tastic channels with like the your your uh, your keys for each channel, um, it, it can still detect that that's a mesh tastic packet coming in based on the header and rebroadcast it. Say I don't know what this is, but somebody's somebody wants to hear it. So let's forward forward that along. Yeah, and there's um, and that's the lost the and found, right? Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say that's just the default, you know, like like Tony said, the, the inclusive behavior, right, of everybody contributes to to everybody else's mesh potentially. Yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, and then lastly is that lost and found, which we kind of mentioned. Uh, Tony, were you, were you saying something about what was the, uh, the thing you mentioned? Oh, I was just going to plug the... Um... You said new users. I think it's something that's good to know about, and you can dive in later when you get a little more uh, uh, experience, time with time with this stuff, and also the motivation to to do some of the soldering and additions. But 
Going back to Ben's note about extensibility, the external notifications module uh, is another one that um, I know not to keep plugging my own stuff, but it's a great example of it. Uh, we have the canned messages module that runs the keyboard here. And then we have the uh, external notifications that in this case, for this device, it runs the LED, the piezo buzzer, and the vibration module. And the cool thing about that module, uh, the software module here in the in the, uh, the firmware, is you can have an LED, you can have a buzzer, which is a piezo buzzer. It can be an active one that just does smoke alarm beep or a nice passive one that does uh, tunes and melodies that you can configure. Um, and the vibration motor. Now, Technically, you don't have to have those three modules. You can connect anything you want. You can connect a sprinkler system to it. I mean, you'd have to have a little more uh, interface, you know, sort of devices and, and technology in between those two things. But you can trigger something by an action, right? Like by receiving a message, um, by and I'm also kind of I don't want to confuse that with the the uh, remote hardware mm -hmm. um, module that can actually trigger things. But the point of the the, the external notifications is you can have lights and sounds and vibrations and all these cool things on your devices, um, which with just, a you know, flipping a switch, you do have to, you know, solder uh, an LED or in the case of rack, actually, they sell all kinds of modules. You can just plug in these boards that can do lights and sound and all the cool stuff and not have to worry about soldering a single thing except for the screen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just the way for the audience, if they don't know, you don't have to have a screen on these devices. Oh, we lost you your, your mic got weird for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, if, if you don't, uh, if you use a phone app, you don't really need a screen for any, any of these devices. So if you're scared of soldering, you can just buy a rack wireless board. Don't worry about the screen. Everything else is plug and play and snap, snap it on and put it in something. Um, but the nice thing is you have all these options for external notifications and I'll, uh, I'll defer to Ben for the remote, uh, hardware one because he's had some really cool use cases I'm sure he'd like to mention. Oh, that was weird. Your your mic thing, something got stuck in the mic, but then it, I guess it fell out. Like, it's good. It, say say something again really fast. Can you hear me? Yeah, that was weird. You heard that too, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, it, was it, I just having a stroke? Okay, uh, it could be bandwidth on my side. I don't know. No, Sorry, it was good. It's all, it's all fine now. So, yeah, go go ahead, Ben. Where are you going to add right. to that? No, I was just going to add on to the to the um, external notification stuff. You know, the, um, I don't know if, if you've seen on the – the mesh Hasek YouTube channel, but I've, I've shot off a firework with it. Um, oh, wow. Sending, sending an ASCII bell with a rack wireless board with a That's relay so cool. module. I mean, it, you know, you can do anything that you, do you want to do with like triggering high low states on a, on a GPIO pin, you know, that's, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, and that's that's an easy way to do it. It's it's a little bit easier gateway to entry than something like the the remote hardware, which Tony mentioned. That's that's more of the pro user. I I, I confess I haven't really played much with the remote hardware module just because it's it's a little bit of a complex beast to set up. That's super yeah, cool. I, I forgot then that that you use the just the simple external notifications one to do the fireworks thing. That was pretty slick. That was what I was thinking of. Oh, okay, yeah, I love it. Uh, let's let's take some questions. So, uh, one Don uh, N five SKTS does do the GPSs have a one PPS signal that you can tie into? That's like some supreme accuracy in. Uh, in uh, we do. Uh, I'm not a GPS expert. We <laughs> we've got we've got some guys that are really heady into the GPS world. I know that we have uh, certain um, GPS models. I think the T Echo device and i've got one here have we showed we haven't showed that one yet have we no actually uh, i forgot to ask about that that was the other one i was gonna ask because that has the e-ink display right is that it, do you guys like that one is that a good um one? it's mixed i would say because oh. it's uh it has some issues with the e-ink uh the, the e-ink refresh um code is not executed on an, a, another thread so there is possibility that you can, if you receive a message in a certain like split second, you can actually miss it because the CPU is tied up rendering. Um, so see. there's, there's, that's kind of one of the little caveats uh, up until recently, partial refresh didn't work on that device either. But mm. now that that's been supported, I would say I, I appreciate it a lot more. Um, but it is in our F52 base, and it has the SX1262. So it's it's like the rack wireless option in that regard, mm -hmm. and it has the it has the GPS built in. 
um it's a cute little form factor in an injection molded case so i yeah. mean it's it's an it's a neat device um if you just want to grab something and go um the buttons are really surprisingly uh easy to hit if you're running it in a case that's my one of my pet peeves with it <laughs> it kind of looks like it the, the buttons are easy yeah. to hit yeah, I've, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've taken that with me and had it off and then taken it out of whatever bag I had it in and it's sitting there on in bootloader mode. I'm like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. We got a, a the, question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Question. So that PPS question, um, I don't think, I don't know if you can tie into any of the boards that have it built in, uh, GPS built in, but I know that those GPS modules that you linked to earlier, the GT-U7, uh, it has a PPS pin that you can tap into, which if you wanted to feed that to some other device. So I know it it does cool. have that if, if anybody's interested. Yeah. Oh, that's so fantastic. That, the the add-on GPS is just probably what you want for that. Yeah, most most GPSs that have uh that that speak NMEA sentences over over a UART uh interface are compatible. Um yeah. you can you can kind of grab pretty much any off the shelf GPS module that's built for Arduino and plug it in and it probably will work. Um but obviously there's some community options like the one Tony mentioned that are like this has been vetted and this this works and it's it's available on Amazon. Hmm. Um, and a lot of that stuff you can get cheaper, obviously, off AliExpress if you don't mind waiting. I would not recommend ordering right now, though, because Chinese New Year is going to set you back. Yeah. In fact, I, I bought something today and I got a discount for Chinese New Year because I'm assuming it it's because they're like, uh, by the way, you're not going to get this for like a week. We're not even going to touch anything. Chinese New Year is <laughs> next weekend. We're celebrating it in our house anyway next weekend. So, all right, Jody has a question. Is there only a single master firmware from GitHub and it works on all of the devices listed on the MeshTastic website regardless of vendor? There, there isn't a single master firmware in, in the sense that there are multiple binaries, but it's all built from the same code base. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of a lot of complexity behind the scenes to make sure that the right code goes into the right spots. Um, and I would point people towards um, the documentation, but also we have an online flasher. So if you go to flasher.meshtastic.org, um, they're for kind of the the actively supported devices um, like the the T beams and the the T echoes and stuff. There's um, there's actually a, a way to flash that online for many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, within your browser if your browser is chromium based so like edge or or chrome um it, it uses web serial under the hood so it has to have you got to have a special special browser yeah i ended up using that to reflash most of my devices as i was playing around with this with the last week so works great uh yeah i've had i had no problem with it aside from that my whiz block one but that's i think that's just my hardware so all right good question next one let's see ah uh, they're asking about DEF CON. Apparently, you guys are popular at DEF CON. How is the database overload going? We kind of crushed the limit at DEF CON. So what's the, what's the background on that one? So, um, you know, as you know, these are devices are, are kind of like low on memory and, um, yes, you know, they're internet like of things devices. They're not necessarily like texting <laughs> your, 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 your BFF, right? Yeah, and so we we didn't anticipate. We, you know, we knew that the the project had gotten more popular, but we didn't anticipate that there would be over three hundred and thirty devices around <laughs> DefCon. And we always put kind of theoretical numbers out there about how many nodes can fit in the MeshTastic node database. So we mm -hmm. call it the Node DB. Um, and I think at the time we had said around eighty. And it, it was just getting smashed at DEF CON because there were so many. And so it was crashing a lot of devices. And we actually put out an update like during the con uh, that that fixed some some issues there. Uh, we have now, and it's kind of a, a still, I would say, an artificial limit of 100 uh, nodes in the node database. Um, and it, it's the way to think of it really is kind of a circular buffer so it's not like a static list of like you hit 100 and then suddenly you're full and you can't take any more nodes we kind of we start to roll off the last node off of the list um, as new uh, contacts come in 
uh, which is a lot more resilient. But um, because you are dealing with such a low uh, with such a low bandwidth, um, you know, protocol, I will say meshes that are that size are not going to perform well anyway. Like you're not going to be able to send um, a message to a, a hundred of your buddies in a, in a small area and have if there's a hundred mesh nodes, yeah. Yeah, so it's you know, and we've we have um, we've gotten more, I would say, performant in larger meshes as we've um, also introduced things like um, internet backhaul through MQTT because uh, you know previously you know we're all sitting around here with what four or five devices at a time. It's like it works great, but then you start getting you know fifty, sixty, seventy. You're like, boy, wheels are starting to come <laughs> off a little bit. So. Um, we, we've had and, to kind of stretch ourselves burning, and burning man, Ben, uh, some yeah, of those fixes, man. right. were implemented yep. during burning man, 2023. And we got some good feedback on that as well. Oh, cool. That's excellent. Uh, let's see. So there's another question for ATAC. I, I think once upon a time, there was more ATAC support. Uh, what, what's the story with that? The question is ATAC requires a much older version of that software to work with mesh tastic. Any chances of renewing the relationship? between ATAC and MeshTastic devs so we can use modern ATAC software? Uh, so that's actually old info. So we have an official uh, ATAC plugin um, ah. in, in MeshTastic uh, ecosystem now, um, uh, the, a plugin developer um, we worked with, uh, Hate on Discord. Uh, he's he's kind of spearheaded that. And so uh, the one thing I'll say with that is make, you have to make sure if you, if you want to do the ATAC thing, you have to get the .gov ATAC. You cannot do the Play Store ATAC. Um, but it, if oh, you go, okay, yeah, it, it, um, there, there's a lot of limitations there. I don't, I'm not an ATAC expert, so I can't, I, I will not say anything I, I'm not really completely familiar with um, on there, but I, I, as I understand it, there's some differences in like the pl plugin support and architectural support. I know the apps are different. So if you're mm -hmm. talking like the government version of it versus the civilian version, those are those are two different applications. So you're saying there's another layer there potentially. Yeah, I I, I just know that the tag.gov version is the one that you that you want for the for the official Meshtastic plugin to work, and that's available on our uh, our GitHub uh, oh, org. Cool. And I think I think we link to it in our in our docs as well. And if you have any questions about that, the um, we have a room in Discord specifically for ATAC stuff. Um, so that's that's a good place to ask. I always point people towards the Discord just because we have such a responsive community. Yeah, I well Discord in general. It seems to be the place for answering questions, I think. Sully asks, question, is it possible to add a single channel without overwriting all of your existing channels? I think that's, yeah, that's easy to do. Yeah, um, I, I know in like, there, there's a little bit of a difference between like the iOS app and the Android app there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the iOS app replaces um, based on the QR code, whereas mm. the Android app, I think allows you to add a channel. You can also add channels via the the Python CLI. Um, there's there's a really convoluted command that you can you can uh, add uh, based on the pre shared key. Uh, yeah, I, we're... I've used both. I, I use both the apps to try and stay up on it. And um, I'm always when I when I create the channels, I when I share it, I'm making mm -hmm. sure that my QR code has all the channels that I want to share. Is that possibly why they're getting blown out? Is they're not making sure to click all the channels that yeah you if you're yeah if you're sharing the channels you if you're wanting to add one where you've added one on one uh platform and you want to share it to the others you have to make sure that you've you've got them all checked because hmm. that will that will ensure that the entire qr code is replaced okay all right let's see i think we got to the end of, i know there was other questions so uh this is your last chance people watching if you have a question for some of the devs here uh, there is a lot of commentary, though. Man, you guys had a lot of uh, comments. That looks like a uh, Mesh Tastics YouTube channel is in the chat too, answering questions. At least, I, I, at least that's somebody posing as them, right? Um, oh, you know that's... what? Wait, I, I think I missed some of them. Oh, I missed a ton. Wait. Okay, so there are way that's... more questions actually. That's probably Crichton from Discord. I know I posted in it earlier, <laughs> and people thought it was a fake account. Yeah. 
What is the advantage of entering your call sign? I don't think there's an advantage necessarily, but more of a rules following kind of thing, right? And more power potentially? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, if you're going to do the ham the ham radio mode, the, the licensed uh, mode, uh, we call it, uh, you know, you get the opportunity to transmit with more power. Um, I can't remember if I sent you the this device when we were talking earlier but uh the g that you you sent the nano uh g2 ultra earlier but the, uh neil howe the designer of that also has the nano station g1 which transmits i think it was a, it's up to 33 dbm which is like what 3.35 watts i believe 3.55 watts yeah okay yeah oh so yeah is that the unitag or U unitang mm -hmm. yeah that so a lot of those, uh, a lot of the radios that are on there, they were sold out. I, I I was looking at that before we went live, and that one in particular, that G station, that's that's a uh, they're out. <laughs> they sold out fast, I think, on that one. Yeah, that one's that one's power hungry when it transmits too, obviously. So it's sure, it's, sure. it's built around uh, larger larger battery packs. I think he's got a battery pack add on for that. All right, Chris Bricker, and this is there's a there's a couple of nuanced questions in here, so let's take the first one first. How far will these go reliably for even the small ones? So height is might, Chris, right? So if you get your if you get one of them up high, then they'll help out all the other ones communicate. But you guys, what are your what are your thoughts there? Um, so I think the average person using this is probably going to be in a semi, semi-urban, suburban environment for the most part. Mm -hmm. So we'll address it that way from my experience. So I'm in Maryland. The geography here is rather hilly, uh, generally su suburban areas. So um, I easily get um, yeah, two, three miles, right? Just point to point. I'm not even talking relayed mesh, right? Because that will right. really extend it. So I can get easily just say with all the power lines, houses, trees, very a lot of vegetation here, uh, some hills. Like I said, um, I, I'd actually, I'd dial it back. So I'd say one to three miles from just point to point. So like you said, height is might. If you have some friends that are between one and th you know, within one and three miles away, you get a note up on their roof, you're going to extend that significantly. Uh, and I know that one of our, our guys uh, on the, in the community, he lives out in Oregon, very flat lands out there. He's done 15 miles easy because yeah. that line of sight is super simple. You know, you're going to reach the other side of that. Um, and then some most of the records you'd set were either um, over very flat land, over water, or from a balloon, you know, relaying stuff right from, from air to ground and vice versa. Um, so I, I would say reasonably just from a planning perspective, a couple of miles at most reliably. But again, that's an urban environment with a lot of trees, a lot of houses, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. The, the key is like you said, just to get one node high. I mean, it just makes such a huge difference. If I think the times when people are disappointed with mesh tastics range is when, they're sitting there with you know nodes on their backpack or whatever. It's man to man communication uh, on on you know fairly uh, rugged terrain. That that's that's not going to be good for any RF, right? So yep. um, just having one node up high makes such a difference, so that you can kind of shoot over over the obstacles. If you go watch my video when I was doing the range test, I took a DX Commander push-up telescoping mask for everybody watching, and I just mm -hmm. duct taped a T-beam to it. And then I had my home station on the ground listening basically to that T-beam. And then that was my range test. And I got like six miles away as the crow flies about. But that wasn't even really trying. And that wasn't with like a, a, a better antenna. Amazon literally sells antennas for 915 megahertz. So yeah, you, there are all kinds of options there to improve. Um, really also just make the the longevity of the device exist outdoors solar power better antenna higher up all those things will pay dividends the second part of this question are there any devices that do all three bands and so i'm i'm guessing i don't know that you need that but maybe you guys have a more nuanced answer to that i, I don't think so and you know it, it really wouldn't do that much uh, it wouldn't do any favors with mesh testing because we only support one radio currently um, yeah. at, a, at a time. So one of the things that we would like to see um, in future versions of mesh testing is the ability to support multiple radios because there is actually 2.4 gigahertz LoRa as well. So um, oh, Simtech cool. has a board called the SX1280. So you can get higher bandwidth transmissions and you do more fun stuff like push to talk audio, um, 
things of that nature. And so it'd be really nice to have like your high bandwidth, low bandwidth um, operation happen concurrently. And and obviously we'd have to get hardware vendors on board with that um, that sort of device. But that's that's something that we'd definitely like to explore. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm actually I'd love holding... something like that for like my home my home node. Oh, for sure. I'm holding a, a 900 to 950 megahertz uh, fiberglass antenna. These are available on Amazon. A lot mm -hmm. of the stuff I got to say are not too expensive. I have to figure out a way to go from Type N though to that tiny little rack connector that's on the board. So I have to look into that some. But coax is going to be your, yeah, your losing IPEX factor connector. here. At that frequency, you got to make the coax run incredibly short. Otherwise, you'll have incredible losses. So mm -hmm. make sure you do that. If you're thinking about buying some of these, I would I would maybe recommend you buy three. One, two to use, like you, your partner, you, whomever, and then one to get up high <laughs> and figure out how to make it stay online for a while. That would be my recommendation to everybody watching. Uh, I did – we got a super chat. Yeah, and I always – I always tell people to run um, power up to the device instead of running the coax up to the to a, you know a high antenna on a mast mm -hmm. because you know power power is easy but like you said you're going to get losses over that coax run yeah. so in some cases you shouldn't even do an external antenna in fact I, I'm I'm planning on testing that with the antenna and then just going back to one that mounts directly onto it with some weatherproofing to see what the differences are because i believe that a vertical antenna is not really going to give you even if it's a full length antenna or whatever is not going to give you gain appreciable to compensate for the losses that you pick up in the feed line uh feed line losses so it's probably better in a lot of cases you know again shut back to the shout out uh of that t-beam this little t-beam elbow antenna performed wonderfully well well better than my expectations so i know it's hard to see now that i got that in the way but uh this guy is is really a cool antenna and i think i think my amazon store still has my mesh tastic links and i did post some links in the uh the video description for you guys to find some of that stuff but julian's random and most uh, of those aftermarket oh sorry no i was gonna mention a super chat go ahead finish your thought thanks I, I was going to say most of those aftermarket antennas that are that are kind of like reviewed by the community um, are going to perform better than the stock antennas. Sure. That's one of the first things that I tell people to upgrade because yeah. the the antennas that come with the devices sometimes are kind of dubious. You put it on a nano VNA and you're like, boy, that's resonant in 700 megahertz. Great. Right. Right. Uh, Julian's random project. Julian's ran a uh, radio repair in Texas. Shout out to uh, Julian's Radio Repair in Texas. Thank you for the super chat. So much interest in the off-grid texting here. Laura stuff is flying off the shelves. So that's, I think that's good. I think it's a, a, also a fun way for people to get interested in just the radio hobby in general. This is a, a, a really fun little usable thing that you can just, you can hand family members this. You can build them up a like a little kit, you know, that uh, that you make or go check out the Etsy store, right, for, for Trofo here. Trofo. Trofo, right? Or is it tropo? I I'm so so stuck yes, with tropo yeah. ducting. It's a ham radio term. It's trofo, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's an old high school music, electronic music uh, deal. You don't want to hear that story. It's kind of lame. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question. Uh, I'm. They're coming in late. Ice poof says, "Who has a ready to go kit? I don't want to solder." Uh, the Heltec, well, possibly? Uh, Heltec, um, I'm guessing? <laughs> yes, I would say one of those boards, like the Heltec's my favorite. T-beams are fine, but the Heltec V3 has all the latest and greatest, you know, BLE version 5. Sorry, my earpiece is falling out. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy 5, it has the SX1262 high, higher power radio that Ben mentioned, and USB Type-C, right? So it's got all the, the latest stuff. Um, they're cheap. You can buy a couple of them for like $30, $40 US uh, from Amazon. You don't have to buy them from China and wait a month to get them. Exactly. Yeah. Maker Focus just rebranded them, right? They're their mm -hmm. same same exact Heltec board that MeshTastic supports. And they're a great, great way to jump in. It even comes with a little tiny antenna, so you can play around with it and yeah. uh, you test it out on your desk before you get comfortable. And then you can print a case, buy a case, put it in a plastic box, whatever you want. I do have that link in the video description for the Helltech and the T Beam that are on Amazon. If you had to ask me where the where you would save money, there is a T Beam markup 
on Amazon. Uh, if you buy through Amazon, it's like a ten dollar markup what you'd pay for Lily Go. So I would say if you if you wanted to get one of these right now and you didn't want to wait for the long boat from China plus Chinese New Year, the Helltech is probably the cheapest way because it's like twenty five bucks. Uh, then you add the GPS if you want. It does come with an antenna, but you should upgrade the antenna. Um, yeah, I, I I like that. Uh, would you add anything else, Ben? Or another option? I would option? say, yeah, I would say the Etsy stores, right? Like, to, you know. Um, uh, I, I think I have one here that you possibly might be able to find some, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know. Those are truly uh, turnkey. That's truly turnkey. That's going to show up with the right firmware and you'll be ready to go. Yeah, there, no soldering Absolutely. required, right? Um, so uh garth uh who we you know mentioned earlier um does the ios app he also has a etsy store so um he sells some ready to go devices i think mostly based on the the rack in our f52 um devices so that's another option but yeah like you know you don't have to make these devices yourself if you're if you're uh uh a intrepid tinkerer then obviously you can but yeah not everybody not everybody wants to break out the soldering iron and the 3D printer. How much time do you guys have? Because we got a lot more questions. <laughs> I gotta ask I'm, that I'm question. Good I, for, we're, I'm good for another half hour. Okay. No yeah. we're, we were pretty ad hoc on this live stream, so I don't wanna I don't wanna stress <laughs> you guys out for, for like and hey, yeah, hey Josh, some random so internet guy. Interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Garth, Garth's in the lobby. He mentioned oh, that. Thank I, I you, thank you. Chat, so, yeah. We're adding Garth. We're adding our, our third uh, this is the iOS developer whom I've actually talked to. Uh, a couple of years ago, right? He, Garth does the iOS work. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Well, while he's joining us, I'll I'll queue up the next question. Someone asked it, about. Go ahead. Oh. I was going to say we we invoked him by talking about his Etsy store. That's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked about server rack mount. Could a rack wise gate work with mesh tastic? Wise gate. Now I'm not sure about the uh, wise gate. If that might be one of their. Rack has everything is like Wiz Block, Wiz Core, Wiz Duo. They, they everything is Wiz. Oh, so it's like a, a an outdoor. It's like an outdoor gateway type. Oh, of thing. it's it's LoRaWAN. So unfortunately, it, it probably probably not since they're different. Uh, they're Laura, but they're different implementations, right, Ben? Gotcha. Yeah, that that's a Lor that's a LoRaWAN gateway. It's it's not compatible. So LoRaWAN is a little bit of a different beast, despite sharing the the first four letters um mesh tastic operates on laura peer-to-peer -peer, which is more of an ad hoc communication whereas laura wan is a very like controlled multi-channel synchronized um protocol well so now that gar's here yeah, i get to do my dramatic animation which is me holding down a mouse button and then slowly <laughs> dragging the lower third out to reveal and garth at the end here so garth how you doing man thanks for joining us you're muted right now by the way Good. How are you guys doing? Just got back from uh, Whitefish doing some snowboarding. So, oh, that's well. Thank you so much for hopping on. I know this was like super ad hoc and out of the blue, but but thank you for being available. This is this is really great. So you develop, or you're actively working on the iOS application for uh, MeshTastic, right? Yep. So good work, I have to say. As a as a primary iOS user, that's the one I use most of the time. So thanks <laughs> thanks for the work you're putting into that. Thank you. It was issue number two, so I was pleased to close that one and get an iOS app uh, working. So <laughs> very good. Uh, let's see. What's the frequency is asking question? Does anyone have an IP67 or better case for their kits? So the full weather Ooh, up. That's is a the, tough one. Uh, isn't the rack? If you're talking, well, um, IP67. I mean, for those that know what it oh, is, that, they're very specific. They're, they're very specific, um, you know, requirements, right? And certifications to test and certify things for IP, whatever. Um, but if you do look at the list of what the requirements are, you know, oh, I could take spraying water from, you know, 18 inches for three hours or whatever. Um, there are options that definitely people have created. Um, my little, again, plug on my stuff, but my little pocket mesh case here, this thing floats for one. So you have to forcibly submerge it. And I've tested it for 90 minutes under like a foot of water, which I know. Oh, wow. Again, I'm, I'm, this isn't a certification lab here. It's 3D prints and laser cutting. Um, but at the same time, if you want something that is going to survive the average use, something like this, it's going to get you there. If you want to mount this outdoors, there are other, you know, weather proof sort of enclosures you probably want to get uh, instead of something handheld. But 
you know, unless you're underwater, this isn't going to be underwater probably. So this is, I would say good enough in quotes, but again, I'm not a certifier, but uh, I'll, I'll defer to to uh, Ben and uh, Garth on that one too as well. So there there is the uh, the rack box B2. Have you guys experienced this? This is you're probably familiar mm-hmm. with this, right? Is that that might be the best you can go? Maybe I don't know. Garth has some options, I would say, on his on his Etsy store as well that are um, built around some different enclosures that oh, offer nice. similar similar capabilities. Um, you know, it, it's funny because Gar- Garth and I kind of met over the discourse years ago, just going over different solar options and enclosures and stuff. Just get, you know, hey, have you tried this Plano case? Hey, have you tried this? <laughs> Well, uh, what say you then, Garth? Uh, add your thoughts. And uh, do I have the Etsy, right? Is it the same Etsy or? Yeah, uh, Garth VH is the Etsy store. Um, I'm looking here right now because I can't remember if the case that we use is IP67 or 8. Uh, it is IP67. Um, so the solar node that Ben and I have worked on, um, we have a version that has an integrated panel Ooh. and then a version that will accept a larger 12-volt uh, or or larger even panel um, to allow for uh, even more remote locations. Those enclosures are, are IP67, um, have a really good seal, and uh, are are uh, are not 3D printed. They're um, they're an enclosure that we have machined, and then have the uh, Meshtastic logo printed on there as well. That so. is. Uh... I'll probably be buying very expensive live stream for me uh, this week, guys. Everybody watching, I'm, I'm going to be adding that to my uh, to my shopping cart because <laughs> that's perfect. That's exactly what I need because it's also it's also kitted out for the uh, sort of the the whiz block system, right? The the rack, so that that looks great. And you've got the so is the SMA are the SMA connections built into that? Does it come? Oh, is that is that the full kit? One hundred nineteen dollars. You get all of that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the link in the chat. They might be gone by the time we end this, but I, I might have to add this to cart. I'm gonna see if I could reserve it before the end of the show. <laughs> That's I'll great, man. This week too. I will also say that that one makes if you um if you add the feet to that and put some of the magnetic uh, rubber mounted feet from Amazon on it, it makes a fantastic car uh, node that you can just snap onto your car and run around. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Oh, and that's a really smart idea. Done. Dude, that'd be really good for uh, range testing, too, because I know you got that feature in there, too. That makes my life a little bit easier for range tests on antennas. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good idea. All right. Uh, let's see. Any plans to add a default channel <laughs> with 500 hertz bandwidth for non-hams? Is that even a thing you can do? 500 kilohertz bandwidth so that's pretty, oh kilohertz sorry i missed the k that's pretty that's pretty high bandwidth mm-hmm. i don't i don't know that there's any any immediate plans to to add that as a default i mean it, p- folks can uh, obviously change um the actual bandwidth in the uh custom like lora parameters we we give all of the knobs av- available for folks to, to ratchet around with and and change but um i we tried to come up with a band plan uh, in, in terms of like the, the LoRa presets that made sense um, for different link budgets. So you've got like your extremely high link budget that's very slow for a small mesh that makes sense. And then you've got the high, uh, super high bandwidth, lower range mm-hmm. uh, link budget for, you know, I just need to connect like a big sensor network in this warehouse, basically. That's, okay. That, that's all a lot more chatty so let's see how can well this is a really good question how can we support mesh tastic that's from nick is asking uh go to the open collective and or um if you are interested in an individual developer you can also generally sponsor them on github so those are the two easiest ways to sponsor the project i would say so making sure i have the links right you said the open collective where where is that how do i pull that up to show people i think you can get to that through the through our dot org i think we have a link i've got the dot org open if you go to is that the is that this link with the let's see opencollective.com slash meshtastic there we go
There you go. All right. I will. Uh, oh, wow. You guys got this all set up. Excellent. So, yeah, if you want to help them out, uh, there's a donation path for. Uh, and it looks like you guys have a lot of supporters, too. That's fantastic. So good. Good job. I mean, I, I love I love that we guys do. So uh, if you got the time, let's see. I'm going to keep throwing questions at you until you tell me to stop. <laughs> Question. <laughs> ESP32 V3. Are there Wi-Fi issues? So this is asked by resistor Wi-Fi issues. So I'm assuming they mean the S3. Uh, I don't think there are any Wi-Fi issues that I'm aware of. I know some. There's some interesting stuff, definitely, with different folks like home Wi-Fi setups that where there will be something that we really can't reproduce. And mm -hmm. I don't, you know, who knows what hardware folks are are running on their on their own home Wi-Fi. I haven't experienced any issues personally with the S3 devices like the tdac is runs on the the esp32 s3 for instance and mm -hmm. as is the hell tech um so so those are all like kind of later generation esp32s versus that original t-beam that that was running on the the first gen esp32 so it's a it's a little bit of a different different technology okay so the um the two ESP32 Wi-Fi issues that I've dealt with the most, it, it works much better on a 2.4 exclusive network. So I've had uh -huh. some trouble when it is on one of those combo networks that sort of pops between 2.4 and 5. Um, mm -hmm. And then if, you're, if you have a Eero or, or one of the mesh networking systems, it can get, if it's in between stuff, if it's not near an AP, it can kind of go on and off. Um, so those have, those have been some of the issues that I've, I've had before there. If you get it close to an AP, um, and then get it on a 2.4 gigahertz network, uh, I found it to be pretty reliable, but it does depend some on your networking. All of these IOT devices are really basic networking things. So like the rack right. ethernet connector is a, you know, 10, 10, um, sl shows up as orange in your router, uh, um, network connection, but it doesn't need a hundred megabit to do, uh, to transmit a little bit of mosquito around. So, um, so that's, that's really the key thing is to, if you have a complex network is to go in and make sure that you use the basic settings and, and, uh, a, a IOT specific 2.4 gigahertz network really helps, okay. which a lot of routers support. Yeah. All right. Do uh, Don's back with another question. Do the devs support the Mesh Tastic Facebook group? No, we don't actually. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um, I have had of the handful of things that I not even really issues, just you know things, questions I had. Uh, the Discord's where it's at. You guys are like super active Absolutely. on the Discord. I got immediate response, like almost instantly, even like super late at night um, on the Discord. So <laughs> I think that's where I would point people to. The Discord never sleeps. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah there's some spurious <laughs> communities like the the Facebook group that I think some of our there's some overlap, but I don't know that they're necessarily like official run mesh asset communities. So I love the term spurious communities. A uh, good yes. choice of words for the ham radio crash course. That yeah, you guys yeah. <laughs> perfect, that one perfect choice. You guys. Yeah. Uh, Frank Ham Radio Wilderness asks, will this interface with Arden or can it? Have you guys thought about Arden? Are you familiar with Arden? It doesn't necessarily interface with Arden because Ar Arden is like more of a like TCP based system, right? Uh, yeah, so, it's like mesh Wi-Fi. Yeah. So, I mean, there's potential that you could bridge that. You um, could, yeah, bridge sensors or something like that. Or yeah, I guess so, devices. Yeah, the Python uh, CLI has a IP tunneling um, interface where you can basically um, emulate TCP IP, but it's very slow because this is LoRa. So right. um, it's, it, I don't recommend it to people, but if you, if you want to play with it, it is there. <laughs> uh, we got, let's see, Frank got that one. Okay. Let's see. I think I got, thank you everybody for the questions. Ah, so I think this might piggyback on the the DefCon comment from earlier. Is there a limit to the density of mesh? Like, can it get overloaded, or does it just work better with more nodes? A little bit of can... both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It depends. Um, the ham radio answer. Yes. 
So I think I think realistically, the like limit of concurrently connected nodes on a single net mesh like interacting is the theoretical limit's probably about three hundred um, at at a single time concurrently connected. Now, in reality, when you're using this mesh network, it, it's flood routing, so they're not really they're not really connected in the TCP type of way. So like Ben was saying, like the node DB on the device is really not net, like the apps can store many more node records than the node DB on the, and, and all of your messages and, and data and stuff than the memory of the, the small device can. So we are endeavoring through MQTT and optimizations to our routing and stuff to be able to support, um, I, I think probably three or 400 sort of devices uh, uh, roaming around at the same time is probably where we're going to wind up with um, on one of the, the faster presets. Um, I think Ben and had said before that we started out using very long slow, which is a, a really distance optimized. Um, the last time you used Meshtastic, it probably had very long slow as the default, yeah. um, which was distance optimized. There's been much more interest in uh, because of the disaster and emergency preparedness uh, in having both a public and sort of a private mesh approach. So we figured out that the way that the LoRa channels were set up would allow us to, um, you can set up a primary channel that is private, and then you can create a channel with the same name as the default one, which is long fast as one of your secondary channels. Oh, okay. And then your position data will stay on the primary channel, which is your private network. And then you're able to chat with, uh, you know, neighbors, whoever that are not necessarily on your, your private network as well. So, um, in my experience, the, the main thing that could make larger networks hard is that people do things like turning up the hops to seven, and really increasing the broadcast uh, intervals to faster things. So we're working on um, one of the roles that that we had been talking about is doing more of a like event role. So when we're doing like the Burning Burning Man, DefCon, these things where you know you're going to have a bunch of people, you can kind of turn down the traffic of some of these things that aren't real help. You know, range testing while you're at DefCon with 300 people on there is probably kind of not the best <laughs> thing to be doing. Right. That, you know, you're overloading the network with range testing or detection sensors or, or things like that. So um, I think that's probably how we're going to address that is, uh, is work on improving the roles. We, um, we recently made some MQTT updates and kind of uh, segmented each region. So before it was every, um, every single, uh, node that joined the MTT, MQTT, excuse me, would, would join the same root topic essentially within MQTT. And then they were all together. Um, and this, this causes problems for a number of reasons. Uh, Europe, for example, has a 10% duty cycle. So being combined with us people who do not have restrictions really made it difficult for them. Uh, and then we, as, uh, we added features. So Ben and I worked on a feature to, to, add a, a MQTT proxy to the uh, phone. So you can actually run, instead of having to have a ESP32 that has Wi-Fi, you can use your phone as the TCP connection and use MQTT like with the rack boards that don't have Wi-Fi. Um, so that's really opened up. Uh, the, once you put it on the phone, people are way more likely to use it. So. We, the overloading that you're hearing about on MQTT is a, is a result essentially of this feature that I don't know how old has it been two months. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty new. Yeah. And, and that one was, we, you know, when folks kind of found out what it was, it, it really took off. Um, sure. we, we probably didn't advertise it very well. Um, when we, you know, we threw all the, the buzzword salad at folks and then we're like, well, you can share your phone's internet connection with your with your mesh tastic device, and people are like, "Oh, okay." Yeah, it's not exactly what it does. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably too much for those little devices. They'd melt if you tried to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I think this might be. Our, I think I'm going to take this as the last question. Uh, so I, I actually didn't ask how many of you are actual. Uh, are you are, are you all amateur radio operators? No shame if you're not. It's not a big deal. But this is a little bit I'm in not. the weeds. 
<laughs> no, no problem. I, I, I was really... professional one in the military, but not amateur now. <laughs> you, you should be able to answer this no problem regardless, I think. Uh, could this be used by a county Aries and Racies group? So Aries is um, mm -hmm. the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and Racies is the basically Department of Homeland Security Emergency Response Group for Emergency Communication. We often uh, use VHF, UHF radios for that, and we'll set up like a you know, you know, we'll set people up with a radio like in a location and they'll kind of bent pipe human connection way of moving traffic. I, I think where this question is going, because a lot of the times we have to pull files and data off of devices, like we'll connect it to a computer to make, you know, to send actual documents and whatnot. This might be too heavy a lifting for this, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? So I actually talked with uh, a group here locally in uh, uh, I'm I'm from Washington. So um, right there there's a there's a local group that's that's doing some testing of that. Um, I think he he's working with some students at Arizona State. So like you've described, they have kind of a big spreadsheet um, yeah. that they they're actually driving often on a four wheeler between. Yep. a base camp and then a location where they have comms available to send that data out. Um, and so I don't know, I haven't taught him about progress recently, but one of the things they were looking at was kind of taking that spreadsheet, right. And then sending each row as a message um, yeah. Yeah. to, to the, which, which would work fine. Right. You've got um, enough bytes there to, to send, the text information that's in that row of the uh, it's a pretty standard uh, FEMA spreadsheet, I think that they use. Yep. So, um, so that's sort of, that's sort of one approach that uh, that one local group is working on. And, and we'd certainly be happy to talk to and work with uh, anyone who's interested in, in kind of working on setting up a, a, a better way to avoid that sneaker net and, and get some of that data, you know, to the base, station there faster so yeah and we're always looking for you know when folks have a, a compelling use case like that like getting in touch with us to try to maybe create some um more bespoke payloads for it um in our uh we, we use proto buffs under the hood uh, protocol buffers for for uh non-developers it might not mean much but it's a it's basically just a um a way of of uh transporting data um in a in a over the wire efficient uh mm -hmm. format and so you know if we can come up with good containers for that stuff we can absolutely send it over over the mesh if it's with within reason right <laughs> yeah there's there's a standard form they use called an ICS214 and and this is not for moving data like in the terms of like a file or something like that this is like text line transmission that generally meshtastic works with right so you'd have to pull that off, which you, you could do if it was like a Wi-Fi connected mesh. You might have the ability to pipe, just pipe. Maybe you had a pipe capability that you could just pipe it into a text document. And it was just like a flowing stream of text instead of it being like a copy paste job kind of thing. That might be interesting. Yeah. And the spreadsheet that I saw had image names in it. So we couldn't send the images over. Sure. Laura, yeah. But it would send the data that, that kind of kept set that connective tissue between the photos and uh, uh, locations and stuff. It seems like they take a lot of photos as they're searching and things to, um, oh, to kind so that's, of figure out. That's like SAR. That's like uh, search and rescue volunteer kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of the the emergency communications guys, like Aries and Racies, they they send these IT uh, ICS 214s. And that's always like text docs. It's it like, you know, it, it gives you the detail of like who the person is, you know, what they found, what the disaster damage right. was, etc. You know, it's almost like a the blotter, the plotter, if you will. Like, no, the blotter was the right term for like just text that you're getting, like a stream of text almost. So in that sense, mm -hmm. that could be done line by line, message by message, if you just could pipe it into something is just like a raw feed almost. 
Yeah, this looks absolutely doable. Doable. I'm looking at the ICS two fourteen. Oh, cool. Yeah, take a look. Yeah, they they've. If you consider how far ham radio has come, and this this form has existed in many different ways, uh, we've had low transmission modes forever that we've been able to do this with. So it's it's really more of the formatting and how you would transfer mm -hmm. that data. That's the question. So I'm sure it's possible. It just you'd have to come up with the right way to do it. I think. Yeah, and we we definitely do a lot of uh, cost cutting on on the what. <laughs> Over you have the wire. to yeah you have yeah. to right yeah yeah so what so people are always surprised when they come in and like latin longs are like compressed into like a an integer 32 and they're like what and you're like yeah you just multiply by uh by one e7 and, and you're you good. don't understand the size of variables guys we got to use small variables <laughs> yeah Keep you don't get small. it you don't get it uh, I think that's going to be our last question. You guys were fantastic uh, making this happen, and I, I really do appreciate this ad hoc live stream that you know you guys were just made yourselves available for. This is this is fantastic. So I mean, there's there's really no better you know mention of you guys being a part of the community. I was literally just kind of asking my questions in the Discord, and you kind of made yourselves available to to do this. And I, I hope everybody that's watching really appreciates that. So thank you all for taking the time. I really do mean that. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and Garth, I hope you, you got some good powder in today. Were you out snowboarding, skiing? What was that? Snowboarding. Yeah, I did snow today. So I did go to, I went good. to Canada for a couple of days and it was a little icy there. And uh, then we came back and, and rode in Montana today. And I don't know, probably snowed six inches while we were here, which is pretty good for La Nina. So. Yeah. The Pineapple Express. We're all dealing with that on the uh, the West Coast right now. Yeah. I'm getting rain right now, so uh, which is rare for us, so we'll take it. Uh, so everybody watching, uh, we're going to wrap this up, and we're going to go do the Discord after chat. I know the, the folks that are here don't know what that is, but we, we do a, another live stream after this to just answer ham radio questions. If you got the time, I've already took in, taken too much of your time, but if you, if you want to stick around on our Discord, we've got a a follow on thing we do. So if you'd want to hang out in the Zoom, I can help you set that up. If not, no big deal. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the stream. So if you guys want to hop off, if you got the time, but I, I you know appreciate y'all. I, I really do appreciate that. This is really really awesome that you took the time to answer all these questions and kind of explain more about the system, which uh, I think is amazing. And I just you know hope more people find out about it and and get to using it and really enjoying it. So again, appreciate it. Your first series of videos really uh, provided us with a lot of great contributors. So we, oh, we that's were happy awesome. to be here. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah you, the HRCC I, bump, man. I, I mentioned <laughs> as, as you were joining us that, that you, Garth, were the one that helped me through a lot of my initial issues with it. And you were like right there on the spot answering my questions. So I was like, man, this is this is awesome. Like you, this is it was it, you made it really easy to get to get started with. And. I, and at the time, I don't think you know who I was from anyone else. And, you know, I was just a, a dude on Discord and it was it was really cool. So I, I really do appreciate that. All right, no guys. Problem. So thank you so much. If you want to hang out, Thanks, we'll, we'll talk after the live stream. But I'm going to wrap things up over here. So I appreciate it. Guys, just a reminder, there are links to everything. I did drop the link to, uh, to Garth's Etsy. I, I will. Let me go back a step. Can I do that? I'm going to make sure I do that right now. Uh, just just, just for funsies. So some of you got like uh, all of these in their carts right now. <laughs> There's two left <laughs> that are available, and the rest are sitting in carts. So you got you to lock that up. Uh, otherwise, you free it up for somebody who wants it. Uh, don't just sit there holding it in the cart, okay? Buy it or, or get off the pot. That's what we like to say. All right, we're going to wrap things up. We're going to go to the Discord after chat. The link is in the description for the Hammer Radio Crash Course Discord. Go down to hashtag live dash stream slash after chat. And I'll be back online in, I don't know, give me a couple of minutes so I can get a new live stream going. And we're going to talk about a, a new box that's behind me. We're going to do a bit of an unboxing, literally, with an HF radio that showed up right before I went live today, which uh, I have no experience with. Also, we're going to take your questions live, and if we've uh, got some mesh-tastic traffic, I can at least forward it to the right people down in their Discord. Their Discord is also linked in the uh, video description, so check that out. Big shout out to the patrons. You literally are the reason I did this. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the suggestion to talk about Meshtastic again and kind of brush off. I, I have had, uh, let's see, 
So I my T beams have been active, and I what am I doing? I'm kind of messaging myself. You know, I, my wife is like, "This is fun, but I don't know if I can get all my friends doing this and build out the network." But my son was the one. My oldest son Ben, he was like, "Can you? Is this something that like you know I'd be able to message you?" And I was like, "Yeah, I mean I could work that out." And it turned out that around that time, that's when I started hearing about the T deck. And the T-Deck allowed me that capability to be able to hand him a device and have him be able to communicate with me. And we've been having a lot of fun so, you know, just being able to message back and forth. And at some point, at some point, I might allow him to take it to school with him as kind of a just a safety way of him being able to communicate with me. They're not really allowed cell phones. So I don't really want him to have a cell phone yet. So this is a, a, a good way to be able to stay in communication with my son. And I, I think, though... I think I'm going to have to go with the one that has the GPS in it because I'd, I'd like to be able to, you know, potentially find him if there's a problem. And unfortunately, the T-Duck doesn't do that. And I don't know if you'd want that. It's a big hog of a battery to do so. So I really do appreciate you all uh, watching and uh, appreciate all the wonderful comments we got. Uh, and yeah, I, I really do recommend, though, if it's if it's more than just the the uh, I, I'm somewhat experienced as a user of the system. But if you've got deeper questions, really do go to the discord, really do join them on the discord. That's where you want to be, because it is uh, it's a fantastic resource with a really fast reacting group of people, much like the Hammer to Crash Course is. But think of that. But for mesh tastic. And that's uh, where you want to be. You'll have a ton of fun with this, I promise, and you're not going to spend a ton of money to be able to get a couple of systems going. You'll be off-grid in the sense that you can get solar panels going with these because they sip power. That's the design, at least if you set them up that way, and you'll have a lot of fun. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, everybody watching. I'm going to wrap things up over here. 73s, enjoy the memes. All right, guys, that was awesome. Thank